Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Tracy Lamont. Dr. Tracy Lamont is our uh, professor of religious education and youth and young adult ministry, and, and really working with uh, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and people around the country and around the world on these topics. My name is Tom Ryan. I'm director of the Loyola Institute for Ministry and professor of theology and ministry. And I'd like to begin uh, with, with a prayer uh, and it's the first part of the ecumenical prayer that Pope Francis uses in his, uh, in his uh, encyclical uh, Fratelli Tutti. And so I'll read it and invite you to read along in silence with me. So I'm going to. So let's start in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And just take a moment of silence, a deep breath as we transition from what has been to what will be. And I'll read this prayer and I invite you to join with me in silence. O oh God, Trinity of love, from the profound communion of your divine life, pour out upon us a torrent of fraternal love. Grant us the love reflected in the actions of Jesus, in his family of Nazareth, and in the early Christian community. Grant that we Christians may live the gospel, discovering Christ in each human being, recognizing him crucified in the sufferings and the abandoned and forgotten of our world, and risen in each brother or sister who makes a new start. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we'll read the, the, the we'll conclude with the, the end of that prayer. It really is a lovely uh, prayer uh, to start with. Um, so just a, a word we offer in the Loyola Institute for Ministry, graduate and undergraduate degrees online, on campus, and on site. I know we have people from uh, Jacksonville, St. Augustine, Augustine. We have people from uh, who uh, many Limex graduates, Art Turner from Louisville, and many others whom I, I haven't even seen all our participants, um, who are graduates and students of ours. We offer programming in Spanish and England, English that is Catholic, Ignatian, practical, transformative, and for, uh, affordable. We also offer programming, and here are some examples of, of opportunities that we have. Um, we offer uh, we offer programming such as these lovely videos and lesson plans that teachers and religious educators can use in their curriculum to talk about Catholic social teaching. Um, so I invite you to, uh, how can we serve you? How can we in the Loyola Institute for Ministry serve you? Students and graduates uh, who have joined us for this, let others know about your experience with us. So here are my reflections. As you can imagine, uh, if you follow social media at all, there have been many responses and much material on Fratelli Tutti. And I would invite you to read some of the appreciatively critical pieces in America Magazine and Commonweal Magazine and other uh, magazines like that. I want, what I want to offer is both less and more. So this is gonna be a short presentation but hopefully I want to all offer you uh, some new perspectives that you wouldn't find elsewhere. First, some background. So I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. First, some background. Pope Francis has written eight major documents. Um, uh, these include five apostolic exhortations. So Evangelii Gaudium, on the proclamation of the gospel in today's world, which I find a really uh, uh, inspiring document, a document, Amoris Laetitia, uh, his follow-up to the Synod on, on, on the family, um, Gaudete and Exaltate. Notice how, how often he uses words like joy and, and beloved and things like that. Christus Vivit, which is a very important document on religious education and youth and young adult ministry and carried out Amazonia on, on as a, as a follow-up to the Synod on the, on the Amazon. So five apostolic, major apostolic uh, uh, exhortations. 
An encyclical, which Fratelli Tutti is, is a letter sent around. And you see that word cyclical in, in the word, sent around, originally just to churches in the local area. The first use to this term, as we understand it, to address significant issues to a wider audience was, was only in the 18th century. So a moderately recent development using this, this format to communicate to a wider audience. A friend forwarded me an email when he heard about this session on Fratelli Tutti and the email highlighted one of the document's most challenging claims in order to dismiss the entire document in its entirety. And so, and I'm gonna address that, that claim. But what I responded to is his email and said, here's how I approach encyclicals. I don't necessarily agree with their every word, but I see them as opportunities to form my conscience. So I approach them prayerfully and try to listen to them with an open mind and an open heart to be open to the challenge that they represent. And I guess that's how I would invite all of us to approach for Fratelli Tutti, to really listen um, to them. So um, my, and in response, my friend said, thanks, an approach seems very good. So, so my email worked. Um, here is what uh, Pope Francis says about this encyclical on fraternity and social friendship. He says, oh, he, I'm sorry, I, I meant to say, here are the encyclicals that Pope Francis has written. His first one was begun actually put by Pope, Pope Benedict XVI, um, then Laudato Si on creation, and then finally Fratelli Tutti, uh, uh, this one. And so here's what Pope Francis says early on uh, about Fratelli Tutti. He says, although I have written it from the Christian convictions that inspire and sustain me, I've sought to make this reflection and its challenge um, an invitation to dialogue among all people of goodwill. So Pope Francis sees this document as, as really addressing the whole world. And, uh, and it begins with, uh, and it really it's, it's, its genesis, its catalyst was a meeting with a grand imam from Egypt of El Aljar Ahmad El Tayyip. Tayyib, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but uh, the grand, e grand imam of, e of Egypt. And they together put out this document, a document on human fraternity for world peace and living together. And several times, uh, Pope Francis mentions the grand, grand imam in this. In this uh, so he's in dialogue, in conversation, and really models what he hopes to achieve. That is, that is solidarity and connection with people across all lines that divide us. So this is the catalyst for uh, this document. The other catalyst was a bit of a surprise to Pope Francis and really to all of us. And that is uh, COVID the COVID-19 pandemic. So both of those themes kind of give rise to Pope Francis's reflections. To give you my brief impressions on this document, I'm gonna to need to dig into the weeds of Fratelli Tutti and look at things that perhaps only a professor can love. It's a fairly long document, but not the longest document. And so this is uh, the number, this is my word count. I'm not sure that my word count is precise, but my word count of, of his major documents in English, these are the English words. Um, so um, it's a fairly long document, but not the longest. I was also struck, and as I'm sure you were, by the number of footnotes. <laughs> this is uh, the number of footnotes. Um, it has more than any other document besides his document on the Amazon. And here is whom he cites in those footnotes. He cites himself the most, which is a common practice, Interestingly, then Pope Benedict, Pope John Paul II, the Pontifical Commission for Justice and Peace, uh, and, and so on. Um, he also cites, as you see at the end, a, a director, a film director, Vim Vendors, who made Pope Francis a man of his word. Strikingly, you'll have to be on the lookout for a new 
uh, documentary about Pope Francis that was just announced today. But Pope Francis is, 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 is attentive to the, the uh, filmed word. He also cites, he has eight references to a TED talk that he gave. Um, interestingly, he's given another TED talk very recently on creation. So he's using new media to, to communicate his message. He also cites Martin Luther King Jr., Desmond Tutu, Mahatma, and Mahatma Gandhi, as well as German theologian, Jesuit Karl Rahner. Strikingly, he does not cite any women. And, uh, and, and that would be a critique that some have leveled against this. Even its title is, while the, the document is addressed to all people, sisters and brothers around the world, its title just has brothers in it. And you could say, well, that includes sisters, but, but why not say that? So anyway, that, that's a critique um, uh, that, that some have leveled against this document. But my hypothesis, a hypothesis that I need to test is that Francis devotes more words and more t t notes, to, more footnotes to topics that are controversial. And here's one bit of evidence. One of the most controversial topics in Fratelli Tutti, the one that I got the foot, the email about, is are his challenging reflections on private property that appear in paragraphs 118 to 120. These paragraphs include all kinds of footnotes, including one note that cites more people than any of the other notes in the document. It, uh, it cites St. Basil the Great, St. Peter Chrysolog, Chrysologus, St. Ambrose and St. Augustine. He, he cites these as if to say, I'm not making this up. This is, this is challenging stuff, but it's nothing new. So I think he, he devotes more notes and more words to difficult things as if to say, look, I'm not making this up. There's plenty of precedent to this. And so there are two words that really stood out to me in this document. And, and I wanted to check how often they were appeared in other documents. They are politics and its variation. So politics appears more than twice as often per word in this document than in any other document. So it's, it's a document about, about politics. And then the word dialogue appears more than any, relatively more than any other, than in any other document that he's written. So some closing reflections on this. The number of words and notes suggests that Pope Francis sees himself as dealing with challenging issues. For example, the issue of private property that I suggested earlier. And as we know, politics, especially at this time in our country is a challenging issue. And there's a temptation among many people today, a temptation to dismiss politics, to dismiss institutions such as governments and the United Nations. But Pope Francis does not dismiss politics. He does not dismiss institutions. He does recognize the possibility they oppose for oppression and demagoguery, but he sees them as important though fallible instruments for connection for solidarity, for sisterhood and brotherhood across lines that normally divide. And he sees them, and, and the key means for this connection is dialogue. And so he also highlights religious freedom and interreligious collaboration as being crucial opportunities for society's dialogue, for justice and for peace. Yet Pope Francis does not place all responsibility on others and on institutions. It's all of our responsibilities to recognize and encounter God and the people and the world around us, to be moved by that encounter and to work as yeah. a result yes. for connection, for solidarity, sisterhood, and brotherhood. Doing so will promote the flourishing of all life. It will promote justice and peace in our time. And I'm gonna conclude with two quotes that make this point. 
he begins for Tutti with or early on says, let us dream then as a single human family, as fellow travelers sharing the same flesh, as children of the same work, earth, which is our common home. Each of us bringing the richness of his or her beliefs and convictions, each of us with his or her own voice, brothers and sisters all. And he concludes with a call for responsibility, reflecting on war. He says, War is a failure of politics and humanity, a shameful capitulation. And he goes on to say, let us not remain mired in theoretical discussions that are only about politics and institutions. And then he uses very bodily language. Let us touch the wounded flesh. Let us look, let us act, let us think, let us hear, let us look at reality through their eyes and listen with an open heart to the stories they tell. In this way, we'll be able to grasp the abyss of evil at the heart of war, nor will it trouble us to be deemed naive for choosing peace. So it's a call to work through politics and institutions, through religions and interreligious collaboration for solidarity and connection, sisterhood and brotherhood. But it's also a challenge to us. Whew, I talked longer than I wanted to, but now we're gonna we're gonna divide into small groups. I think we're all back. I think. Okay. Um, <laughs> that well, good. time went by fast. <laughs> that, that that went by fast. <laughs> maybe if we could just take maybe a minute and and type in chat uh, what what you're called to. Um, and uh, while they, you know, while they do that, Tom, you might want to share verbally what what your group talked about. Sure, sure. Um, and what what we 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 had there there were there were three of us: uh, Sister Jane Francis uh, from Kenya. Uh, her her computer cut out, so she she didn't wasn't able to join us for very long. Oh, we long. had her. Oh, and I was well, about to type what she was going to say. So okay, okay. Well, <laughs> she joined maybe our she group was. Too. She was flitting about, you know, going <laughs> in different groups. Uh, um, so, uh, but we talked about, you know, just the challenge. What, <clears throat> what, what, uh, what implications would there be if we really thought across lines that all people, all creation in a sense, are our sisters and our brothers? You know, that, that what a difference that would make. Another thing we talked about is, is we as individuals can't really, we can make an impact, but we can't make like a worldwide impact, but institutions can. And too often institutions are about power and about selfishness. What would it be like if we held institutions are like we're, we have elections right now, like our local city council, our state government, our federal government, what if we, what would it be like to talk to them and say, you know, let's, how about if we work for the common good? How can your policies, our policies, help us see sisters and brothers all? Um, you know, so that, that institutions like governments and even the, you know, uh, UN are mixed, but how can we hold them to, to that? So those were, th those were my, my uh, colleague and I, my fellow, uh, conversation partner, dialogue partner, and I had, you know, that was really inspiring things. And so, um, how about you, Tracy? Yeah, I was typing a couple things here. Um, okay. One of the things that, that um, Sister Jane Francis did bring up, which I thought was really powerful, is that he talks so much about engaging in politics, and there are some places in the world that you can't do that. You know, and so and so how then the question is, how then do we engage in, you know, political social activity when if if your voice is disenfranchised, you know, mm. so I thought that was a really good question. But we also talked about how, um, you know, this really propels us into everyday life. So even with or without influence in political spheres, this really says you don't, you know, we talked about like, you don't take your Catholic hat off to talk about politics. You don't take your, your Catholic side down to talk about social issues, you know, that, that mm -hmm. our faith should inform our everyday life. So that was really mm -hmm. powerful too. You know, Tracy, uh, Sister Jane talking about 
uh, you know, government elsewhere. She is very involved with small Christian communities mm -hmm. in Kenya. And, and so maybe those can be structures. Those mm -hmm. can be a way of multiplying. You know, we as an individual, I can do some things, mm -hmm. but if I can join with others, it really multiplies. Mm -hmm. And so maybe in some places, governments are not the best place, but there are other structures, mm -hmm. such as small Christian communities. So I'm going to give again a, a shout out to Dr. Alphonse Omolo, who is our, teaching our small Christian community course next semester, and you can join him for that. Tracy, I'm wondering if we might look at some of the comments. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm happy to read some if you like. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, Brenda was saying that she said it challenges us to dialogue that transcends race, gender, politics, and religion and rise above uh, the music of our comfort zone. I love the way you wrote that, Brenda, the music of our comfort zone. Um, yeah, that, that we really have to see ourselves as Christians in the world. Um, and you then, know, Tracy, real, real quick, Pope Francis in paragraph 215, I'm, I'm going off of Brenda's comment about music, yeah. says, quotes a chef. He quotes a chef. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. And says, who says, the chef says, life for all its confrontations is the art of encounter. Mm. So music can be, uh, you know, music can be distracting, but, but, but Pope Francis also talks about, you know, art and art as, mm -hmm. as, as an opportunity for encounter. Anyway, I just mm. made that connection between art and music yeah. and, and, and a chef. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead, Tracy. So Anthony wrote that um, Vera, Roberta, and Anthony were, were moved by his focus on our interconnectedness despite our isolation, and that we need to see each other linked as a family seeking justice for the common good. I, Anthony, you wrote that very well. I, I love that, you know, this idea that we are all put here on this earth to build up God's kingdom, you know, and, and thank you for that. Thank you for your reflections. Yeah, George mentioned, and he was in my group too, that we were talking about um, moving past words and into action, um, that these are really wonderful words and that we also, they propel us into action, you know, to really take these to heart in our churches and in the leadership in our churches, you know. Um, and then Suzanne wrote, uh, we see ourselves called to build bridges through relationships on all levels, political, community, and the world. Suzanne, that's definitely something that, um, I'm teaching foundations of religious education right now. And part of the foundations, you know, the foundations of religious ed are rooted in relationships and in community. And so you can only grow um, from community. And that means your local community, not just your faith community and your parish, you know? So I really appreciate that comment. That's something, li a lively discussion we've been having in my classes these days. Um, and then art, I think is the last one here. Um, group three, Art Turner said, uh, that the document calls us to inclusivity and the need to examine how we use our resources and challenges us to love in the midst of the challenges of the day, like divisions, polarity, COVID, and things like that is, is how are we called to love amidst challenges? And that's, you know, that calls to mind the way that, that Pope Francis talks about in Christus Vivit, and I think he does it in Evangelii Gaudium, but Paul, or, uh, um, Tom, you might remember, but he talks about, you know, ministry as being a field hospital on mm -hmm. the move, you know, and, and I think it was an interview he did for someone at America Magazine, he said it, and I mean, that's pastoral care and is what we're called to these days, and especially mm -hmm. amidst these challenging times, mm -hmm. people are wounded, you mm -hmm. know, and so how can we you know, bring God's love to a wounded, wounded person, wounded. So I think ministry, also the church is a field hospital. You know, yeah. it's, 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 we're all wounded in some ways. And yeah. how can we be healers in the church? Yeah. And the church is a field hospital. Real, real quick back to the bridges thing. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a, that's a, a key theme for Pope Francis mm -hmm. uh, is mm -hmm. that in, in this word, if you're keeping track at home, appears seven times in Fratelli Tutti. So it, 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 it is an important theme for him to repeat it like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's key. Another interesting thing, he uses a geometric term a few times, a polyhedron, yeah. which is a multi-sided figure yeah. to talk about diversity. So it's interesting he uses these geometric and, mm -hmm. and, and structural images. Yeah. So Alphonse um, added, we've got two more that, that came in here. Alphonse uh, said, Francis has challenged us to move beyond our usual comfort, like caring for those known to us 
like Catholics, relatives, friends. And, and he says, how can our Christian communities move beyond the neighborhood, acquaintances, or even local church to embrace all of humanity? Francis has challenged us to spread the love of God beyond limits. Amen, Alphonse. Yes. And that's not something most churches, particularly I would say from my context in the United States, most of our churches are very involved in church work, you know, in, in sacramental preparation, in liturgy, um, you know, events for the church and things like that. And, and Pope Francis has been calling in almost all of his documents that he's been putting out is to go outside the walls of our churches. In one of them, oh, which one is it? He has this vision. I think it's Pope Francis is one of his encyclicals. He has this, this image of um, Jesus knocking on the outside of the church saying, can you let me in? <laughs> you know, and it's just this powerful, I think it was his opening um, to his papacy, like his opening remarks when he became Pope. He said, envision Jesus knocking from the outside, trying to come in, like the world is here for us, you know. Um, so thanks, Alphonse. You know, Tracy, I I'm thinking, you know, Pope Francis, in a sense, modeled, you know, you know, working with this grand imam. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. what, would it, what would it look like for us if we took the document, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the, the document with you. What if it would look like if we took this document and had a prayer service and a reflection mm -hmm. service with, uh, with a local Muslim community? You know, because they write this prayer, this grand imam and Pope Francis write this prayer that they both agree to. So what would what would that be like to, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to that would really call us beyond our, 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 our boundaries. Um, yeah. So that's a really challenging thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a good so, question here. Evelina said we're called to work for sisterhood and brotherhood. Thank you, Sister Evelina. Um, and then Ben and has I just, a question. I, I just want to say real quick, to. Sister Avelina is joining us from Tanzania. Wonderful. And uh, and so thank you, Sister Avelina. It's so good to, to uh, see you and, and hear you from you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ben has a question, and I think it's worth us discussing if we have some time, Tom. He said, do you think our developing technology keeps us apart or is it an aid to reaching across walls and divisions as Pope Francis stressed? You know, uh, so... You know, in our conversation, I really enjoyed our conversation uh, in, with my conversation partner. We kind of talked about how Pope Francis is realistic. You know, in some ways, this this encyclical is uh, oh, it's, oh, there are all these problems in the world. Oh, it's so terrible. And yet, my conversation partner mentioned it's ultimately a document of hope. Mm -hmm. And and I would say probably the same about technology. Technology causes a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. You know, it it. And yet it can also be an opportunity for the common good. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, helping see each other as brothers and sisters. And, and I kind of think that, I kind of think that if we could, you know, hold technology and technology companies and our own use of technology to that standard, it can be a good thing. So Ben, I would say it's mixed, but, mm -hmm. but how can we use it in the service of the common good? And I would, I would add to it is that, you know, technology, as we're all knowing, is here to stay, and its its benefits during COVID have been profound for us, you know, especially during a pandemic. But on the other side of that, I find that there is so much the church and ministry leaders can do with it to model the common good through social media and say things like, you know, how are you, can you, can you do it in, in the Ignatian way? Can you do a, a daily examine on your social media? You know, how, how were you a barrier to God's love in your threads and in your posts? And how were you, you know, a beacon of God's love? And what can you do better next time? You know, I think it's a, a prime opportunity for ministry leaders, especially with our young church to say this, it's an, it's a method of evangelization and witness if we if we can allow it to be you know and to really grapple with it you know grapple with your human instincts to you know be upset with something on social media or whatever it else it is just like it would be in everyday life so i think i think we tend to there's some ministry leaders that shy away from it because they think it's so negative but there's a calling to bring god's love into social media you know and, and, and there are folks that do that very well you know so so thanks ben for that question Marie has a very good point here. She said, I know I cannot walk across the bridge unless I learn to dialogue, listen to others, to respond in civility, and to love all of my brothers and sisters, no matter their convictions. 
if you remember your studies in limb, anybody um, that calls to mind Dr. Cowan's piece, the sacred, uh, what is it? The sacred art of conversation, something like mm -hmm. that. Art of sacred um, conversation. Yeah. And that we really need to, you know, focus on our own communication, on our skills, our ability to be open, um, to take feedback, to be humble, you know, and, and that's a powerful point, Marie. Thanks for sharing that. I think that I appreciate your bringing up the, the Linux course. Yeah. That's yeah. been for me quite a few years ago now. I'm one yeah. of the older ones. But I'll tell you, I learned a lot about that dialogue. Yep. Thought I knew it all. <laughs> no. I'm so happy to hear that. Yes, yes. Yeah. So again, let's, let's, uh, I, I have the closing of the ecumenical prayer that Pope Francis uh, closes the document in with. He also has an interfaith prayer for inter, across, not just ecumenical, not just Christians, but interfaith. So I invite you to look at that. But this is the close of the document. So why don't we start again in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And remember, maybe take a breath, take a moment of silence and gratitude for this time, and gratitude for the challenge that Pope Francis represents, and, 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 and gratitude for the opportunity to, to, to be challenged to encounter and, and to see all creation as brothers and sisters. So let's just take a moment of silence. And this is the concluding prayer, I'll say it, follow me in silence. Pope Francis says, come Holy Spirit, show us your beauty reflected in all the peoples of the earth so that we may discover anew that all are important and all are necessary. Different faces of the one humanity that God so loves. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.